Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. My name is Eamon Siddiqui. I'm a member of the Future Forum Board, and on behalf of the organization, thank you all for joining us today. Future Forum advances a conversation about what's possible through policy. An initiative of the LBJ Presidential Library, Future Forum offers bipartisan discussions, networking opportunities, and community events to inspire a higher level of political discourse in Austin. Our goal is to create civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. If you're not a member, I invite you to sign up before you leave. Members enjoy the best of what the Future Forum has to offer, including first access to events and happy hours, networking opportunities, and the benefits at the LBJ Library. If you are interested in becoming a member, please talk to Natalia, who's back there. This afternoon, we're honored to host a conversation on the remarkable election year we find ourselves in. And I don't mean the US presidential election. This year, more than 60 countries will head to the polls, representing nearly half of the world's population. In our conversation today, we will focus on three consequential elections in Taiwan, Mexico, and South Africa. Moderating today's discussion is Ambassador Larry Andre, visiting professor and the, at the LBG School of Public Affairs, who retired from the State Department's Senior Foreign Service last year after a incredible 38-year career in global public affairs. During his career, he has served as ambassador in Somalia, Mauritania, and Djibouti. Please keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end of the program. And now I'll turn it over to Ambassador Andre to induce the panelists and start the discussion. Thank you. So uh, I was going to introduce myself, but I think that was adequately covered. Um, so I will move on. Uh, but I will uh, comment that I've observed elections uh, in probably a dozen different countries in Africa, uh, the most uh, memorable of them being uh, Kenya, Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Tanzania. Um, uh, to varying degrees, uh, uh, they were challenging elections. Um, I'd like to introduce my co-panelists, uh, Sheena chestnut Greitens, uh, Associate Professor, LBJ School of Public Affairs uh, here at UT Austin, and she is the founding director of the Asia Policy Program. Uh, Dr. Greitens' research focuses on security in East Asia and authoritarian politics and foreign policy. Let's see, uh, Ken Green, Associate, uh, why don't you all uh, uh, come on up is it? Oh, okay. No, I've, I've got it. Never mind. Never mind. Cancel that. Um, uh, Ken Green, Associate Professor of Government at uh, UT Austin. Uh, his research also focuses on authoritarian regimes, as well as elections and voting behavior in new democracies, uh, with a particular emphasis on Mexico. Uh, Laura C., a research associate at the African Center for the Study of the United States at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, her research, ex uh, research explores non-state governance uh, actors in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is a long disturbed region, uh, and US foreign policy in African conflict zones. Uh, we definitely need to talk. Um, so I'm going to repeat a bit what you just heard. Um, Time Magazine uh, compiled a, a list of elections uh, scheduled uh, for 2024. In their words, these are Time Magazine's words, globally more voters than ever in history will head to the polls in 2024 as at least 64 countries plus the European Union representing a combined population of about 49% of the world's population, are meant to hold national elections, end quote. However, of these elections, only 36 of the 64 plus uh, get a free and fair rating over 50%. And this is according uh, to a Swedish think tank called Varieties of Democracy, VDEM Institute. Um, so several of them have a score of zero, uh, or just barely above zero in a couple of cases. These are the usual suspects 
uh, Russia, Belarus, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, North Korea, um, are, are uh, some, there, there's several others. It's interesting to look at the whole list uh, in the article. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, on the happy end of the spectrum, uh, VDEM's top 10 ranking uh, with scores between 93 and 97 percent are in order, uh, Belgium, which gets uh, first in class, uh, Finland, Korea, Portugal, Czechia, Taiwan, UK, Slovakia, uh, Uruguay, and Austria. That's the top 10, folks. We're not on it. Uh, the United States comes in at number 18 with 83%. Uh, Mexico at uh, number 21 uh, with 75%. Uh, South Africa at number 23 with 72%, all respectable. Um, sometimes elections that are expected to be neither free nor fair produce surprises. I remember in 1990, that was the year that I got sworn in as a diplomat, so I was paying attention to these things. Uh, the incumbent Sandinista government in Nicaragua was widely expected to use state power to ensure their retention of that power. In fact, they were voted out. Later, uh, they were voted back in and subsequently took measures to suppress their political opposition so that thing wouldn't happen again. Uh, in the Gambia, a country I know well, a small country in West Africa, uh, in 2016, Adama Barrow defeated longtime dictator uh, Yahya Jame in an election predicted to be unfair. Jame publicly recognized his opponent's victory, yay Jame, but then said he'd stay president anyways for the good of the people. So <laughs> he wasn't going anywhere. Uh, and it was, um, it took a big international and domestic um, effort uh, to force him out, which it, it finally did. Uh, I was ambassador in Mauritania at the time. The uh, Mauritanian president was very close to Jame. I went out to a small town in the middle of the Sahara where, where uh, that president was um, and got him uh, to uh, agree um, to go to Banjul, the Gambia, and make the final push onto the plane, which he did. Um, I observed Kenya's national election in 2007. Uh, the election was free and fair. The election was fine. Uh, however, both sides used dangerous hate speech directed at the ethnic communities associated with their rivals. Not fine. Uh, when the government blatantly manipulated the election results, substituting fabricated numbers uh, for the true vote counts, that were already publicly known. I mean, people at each of the voting stations had taken photos and, uh, and sent them um, uh, to these uh, civil society groups that were keeping parallel counts. Everyone knew what the real numbers were, but the government insisted on um, falsifying the records to keep the incumbent in power. That resulted in massive violence across the country, uh, mostly on ethnic lines. After great loss of life, a coalition government was instituted, which helped end the violence. However, the scars remain. The current president of Kenya, Ruto, and his immediate uh, predecessor, Uhuru Kenyatta, were among the main instigators of the 2007 post-election violence. They both became president. They were on opposite sides of that conflict, and they are the ones um, who uh, ended up in charge. Um, they were, at one point, um, international criminal, uh, 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 criminal court was going after each of them, and then they had to drop the case because all the witnesses against them kept disappearing. Um, go figure. Uh, elections matter. They are often consequential. Um, with that, uh, I turn to my co-panelist, Professor Greitens. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, <clears throat> So I should say that I am actually on leave from UT this year at the Army War College, and they require me to tell you that nothing I am about to say um, should be construed as reflecting the positions of the US Army or the Department of Defense, which is probably something they're regularly grateful for. So 
with that formality out of the way, um, it, it brings me a lot of, of pleasure to talk to you today about the elections that occurred in January in Taiwan to choose a new president and members of the legislature. Um, that's especially true because um, I wrote my first book uh, in part about the period when Taiwan was under martial law, under the single party rule of the Kuomintang, the KMT, um, and was very much not a democracy. And I actually looked at the behavior of the secret police, the intelligence organizations, and the, the repressive apparatus, and the patterns of state violence that resulted before Taiwan democratized. Um, and so when I lived in Taipei and I was doing the research for this book in the early 2010s, um, over the course of a, a couple of years, um, I was actually there, the very first um, research trip that I made was during a very lively set of local elections. And if you know anything about Taiwan election culture, it sometimes involves parades and very colorful figures and um, really watching that while also researching the history of Taiwan's struggle for democracy and period in which it was not a democracy and many citizens and families paid a very heavy price for political opposition. Um, it was especially meaningful to then watch these lively local elections and be able to see just the sort of the fabric and the everyday texture and the energy that goes into the vibrant democracy that Taiwan is today. And it was, it was on the list of, of the top 10, um, which I'm not surprised about, but really I think is a testament to the, the hard-won history of democracy in Taiwan. Um, and is, is something then that, um, that means a lot and that is deeply sort of internalized, if you look at polling data, into citizens' identity. Um, so I wanted to talk today brief um, about the, the elections in Taiwan primarily, their domestic and their global consequences. And then at the end, if I have time, I'll touch briefly on the legislative elections that just occurred in the neighboring country of South Korea, also on the top 10 list. Um, just because in that regional context, I, I think the, um, the elections are, are significant there as well. Um, so in January, voters in Taiwan elected William Lai to be the, the, the president-elect. Uh, he will be inaugurated in mid-May. And so we're in this period right now where we know who the president is, we know who the new members of the legislature are, um, but President Lai will not be inaugurated until, um, until May. And he was previously the vice president to President Tsai Ing-wen, the outgoing president, um, who served eight years. Uh, she was elected twice to the presidency. So this is a turnover from uh, within the incumbent party. So um, the, the, there is not a party change in the presidency, even though we have a new president, because the, the current one, um, Tsai Ing-wen, is, is term limited. The vice president is also Xiaobi Kim, a woman who, until she uh, returned to Taiwan to run for the vice presidency, um, was Taiwan's representative to the United States. Uh, in the sort of quirk of Taiwan's un strong, unofficial relations with the United States, she's technically not titled an ambassador, although you will often hear her referred to as such in, um, uh, in colloquial discourse, but she's, she was the, the representative of, um, of Taiwan to the United States. Um, so has very strong ties in the executive branch on Capitol Hill and in, in civil society um, in the United States as well. Um, legislatively, um, the, the results were somewhat mixed, meaning that there, there will be some constraints on President Lai's domestic agenda. I won't go into a ton of, of details here because I do want to focus a lot on the regional context of the elections where I think the consequences are potentially um, uh, sort of more significant for regional and global peace and stability. Um, but it's important to note that we sitting in the United States or global media tend to cover the Taiwan election as if its outcome was driven by cross-strait relations with Beijing and the threat of potential war in the Taiwan Strait. But it, when you look at the issues that brought voters to the polls, that mobilized them, and that were on their list of priorities, yes, that's there. It's an ever-present factor that shapes life and electoral politics in Taiwan, but so were issues about economic performance and employment and the cost of housing and things like that, bread and butter issues that voters, particularly younger voters, were quite mobilized by. Um, so I just want to sort of, you know, before I move on to talk about the strategic context, I want to remind us all that, that that was a factor, but not the only or even maybe the most significant factor shaping electoral outcomes. Um, so President Lai is regarded as likely to continue President Tsai Ing-wen's tradition. He, um, he is from 
what we call the, the pan-green party, the, um, the Democratic People's Party, DPP, um, which is sometimes characterized as a pro-independence party, but that's actually not their, in, their, in fact, their, their platform. Um, he is, Tsai Ing-wen, mostly focused her energies on trying to reform the military and create more capability for Taiwan to avoid being coerced by mainland China, as well as to open international space for Taiwan's participation in international institutions like the World Health Assembly, economic bodies, um, the international, uh, ICAO, the international body that handles aviation, in part because Taiwan has some major airports. And so excluding Taiwan from conversations when you're trying to manage flight disruptions during, say, COVID um, was, was fairly challenging. Um, so she's widely regarded as having taken a pragmatic approach, and Lai is expected to continue that. Um, that said, Beijing is not necessarily likely to look on this outcome as favorable. This is not the, the outcome for the presidential election that the mainland wanted. They tend to prefer working with the, the KMT, the Pan Blue Party. Um, and so for them to have not only eight years, two terms of a Tsai Ing-wen president, presidency under the DPP, but now to, to have another four, possibly eight years of a DPP presidency rather than party alternation may be concerning because it starts to, it could increase the sense in Beijing that the window is closing, the trend lines are shifting. If you look at poll data on Taiwan, Taiwan identity, um, most people say they prefer the status quo given the costs of trying to change the status quo. But as a matter of identity, more and more people view themselves as Taiwanese, as a distinct identity, and not necessarily as Chinese. And so um, that is part of why we might have seen Xi Jinping emphasizing the Chinese nation as including people on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Um, but it is an identity, that sort of idea that these are the same pan-Chinese identity is something that Taiwan voters are rejecting. That's part of what drives support for the DPP. And so for Beijing, this may be an indication that the trend lines of, of how Taiwan as a society and electorally thinks about the possibility of reunification with the mainland or unification with the mainland, um, that that window may be closing generationally. And that is likely to be concerning. You've probably all heard the, the estimates from our senior intelligence officials saying that Xi Jinping has directed the PLA to be ready to take action in some unspecified Taiwan contingency as early as 2027. Um, I do want to be clear that they usually are, are pretty precise about caveating that that doesn't mean that 2027 is go time. Um, but Xi, Jin and the, Xi Jinping may also be pushing the military to be ready by 2027 because he thinks they won't be ready without pressure from the top echelons of the party leadership. However, all of this makes for a fairly combustible um, mix of political ingredients heading into the inauguration in May. And so my read on Antony Blinken's trip to Beijing, so I, I would, did a, um, an interview with BBC yesterday and one of their questions was, why is Blinken going two days after the United States announced a security assistance package that includes a lot of foreign military financing for Taiwan? Isn't this a bad time to go? And the answer is, well, in that sense, Beijing is likely to be particularly unhappy about that piece of the legislation, as well as some of the support for AUKUS and submarine cooperation that is included in the, in the bill that President Biden signed yesterday. Um, however, one reason why Blinken may have decided not to postpone that trip is that if you're looking at an, uh, elect an inauguration on May 20th, um, that is typically a flashpoint. It's a moment of elevated tension. And so delivering uh, a message and having an opportunity to talk with Chinese interlocutors about what are you planning to do in response? Here's what we would find sort of acceptable and here's what would cross United States and international red lines in terms of, of coercive or escalatory actions during the inauguration. It's probably an important moment and the reason why the trip is happening now as opposed to giving some time uh, for, for things after the, this um, assistance package to settle down and, and maybe be a little bit more cooperative in tone. Um, so I think um, I, I wanted to highlight that I think some of what we're seeing diplomatically now is an effort to try to manage uh, Beijing's response to the outcome of this election and especially the sort of highly symbolic moment that will occur on May 20th when Lai takes, uh, takes the, the presidential office and takes the oath of office. 
Um, briefly, just wanted to highlight also that um, there were elections earlier this month in South Korea, um, also a country that experienced military authoritarianism for decades and had its own, um, you know, difficult, challenging, hard-won struggle for democracy in the late 1980s. Um, president Yoon, it, this was not a presidential election, it was a legislative election, um, the effect of which was is that uh, the South Korean president may be slightly more likely to focus on these regional issues and regional peace and security, in, particularly, in particular strengthening uh, his alliance with the United States and potentially support for, for um, allied efforts to support Taiwan. Um, that is because it, the outcome of that election was that the opposition party, the party that, is, that the president is not from, um, won a majority, not a super majority, but a majority, which they also had before the election, so there actually wasn't much shift. But President Yoon was hoping for, uh, he has fairly low approval ratings right now, he was hoping for more legislative seats to be able to make progress on his domestic agenda because he's being criticized for, for not doing more on that front. Um, and this will really, I think, kind of constrain him from doing so, so he may look to foreign policy to secure his legacy in the next couple of years um, as he finishes his term. He's got about three years left, so a fairly long time to, be, to know that you're going to be hemmed in by opposition in the legislature. Um, so I think what we're seeing is, again, a fairly combustible next one to two months in East Asia. Um, but also a lot of senior attention from some pretty experienced officials who are going to be looking to manage tension, especially China's response, Beijing's response to the inauguration in Taiwan. Um, but again, you know, even if that, that set of issues and that particular focal point is well managed, there are these long-term trend lines and tensions in the region that are unlikely to, to go away. And so as different electoral cycles play out, you'll probably see this uh, pattern of tension ebb and flow, both with the, the electoral and domestic politics of the, the region, as well as of some of these international dynamics. So I'll stop there and then happy to answer questions later. I look forward to, uh, to the rest of the panel. Um, Ken, I believe I'm supposed to introduce you and ask you to come up to the podium as well. So thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today about Mexico's uh, upcoming general elections on June 2nd. I put together some slides uh, for my students, so you have to suffer through them as well. Uh, there's probably more information on the slides than, than we need, so I'll just kind of uh, cruise through them. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of, uh, did this work? Yes. Uh, a little bit of electoral history. Uh, Mexico had a, uh, a dominant party regime with, uh, I guess I would refer to it as a dominant party authoritarian regime from 1929 to 2000. The PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, was in power during that entire 71-year period, um, ending uh, not all that long ago. Since then, um, the center-right PAN has held the presidency for two terms. Mexico features a six-year presidency with no re-election, uh, so their elections line up with our presidential elections every, every three cycles in the U.S. Um, the center-right PAN uh, was, uh, held the presidency for two terms. Uh, the PRI came back for one term, and then the relatively newly formed Morena Party on the left uh, won in 2018 with the current president, Lopez Obrador. Uh, and so that's a little bit of the past for us. Uh, the upcoming elections on June 2nd um, will have an extraordinary number of offices up for, uh, up for election on the federal side, uh, in addition to the presidency, the entire lower chamber of Congress with 500 members, the entire upper chamber, the Senate with 128 members, and then uh, nine out of the 32 governors, if we include Mexico City, which has a, a head of government technically, but it's really, really a gubernatorial position. Nine of the 32 are up for election, uh, as well as a smattering of other positions inside uh, various states. So a lot going on. Uh, all told, almost 21,000 seats uh, are up for election. Uh, so it's an administrative nightmare uh, we'll talk a little bit about who will oversee that in a moment. Um, 
the, there are three presidential candidates that are registered. Uh, in the prior elections in 2018, there was an independent. There isn't an independent in this election. Uh, the three major candidates include Claudia Sheinbaum, who's the nominee for the incumbent Morena party. Uh, and uh, Morena is joined in coalition by the small workers party, the PT, which is here, and the so-called Green Party, which is only a Green Party in Mexico in, by name. Uh, really, they just want some funding from the international uh, Greenpeace organization, but they don't actually promote anything that's uh, pro-environment. Uh, and, uh, and Xochitl Galvez, who is the nominee of this very strange coalition of parties led by the center-right PAN, but joined by the formerly dominant PRI and the, the prior major left-wing party, the PRD, uh, which now only exists as a sort of a faint shell of what it was uh, because of public financing. Almost all of its infrastructure, almost all of its activists have shifted over to Morena, the major left-wing party associated with the incumbent. Um, we don't really need to pay attention in this brief time that I have to Jorge Alvarez Maynes because he has no chance of winning whatsoever. Uh, the reason that he's in the, well, well, we can talk about the reason he's in the race if, if that comes up later on. Uh, Claudia Sheinbaum uh, just uh, stepped down as mayor of Mexico City so that she could run for the presidency. Um, she is uh, a trained physicist. She worked at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories in the US for a while. Um, she's been a rising star inside the Morena party and is closely associated with the incumbent president. She won her nomination in a very odd uh, 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 nomination battle that involves public opinion surveys rather than voting uh, with some mysterious algorithm to sort of bring the results together. Uh, she's also Jewish, which is quite interesting uh, for Mexico. Uh, Xochitl Galvez is, um, has uh, indigenous heritage, um, not exclusively, but partly. She uh, was a senator for the PAN. She was also the mayor of a borough in Mexico City, in central Mexico City for some time. Um, she's a successful businesswoman, and she was nominated after it was clear that Shane Baum would get the nomination for Morena. I think the strategy is that maybe uh, Xochitl can take some of the votes away from Morena in the south of Mexico due to her indigenous heritage and some of the votes in uh, major cities and in the north of Mexico away from Morena due to her background as a successful businesswoman. Um, but things don't seem to be going quite as one would have hoped, uh, or at least as Galvez would have hoped. This is uh, Claudia Sheinbaum. This is a poll of polls, so the average uh, in recent polls is 58% of the preferences, uh, 36 for Galvez, and just 6% for the recording. Sorry. Uh, and 6% for, for Mines. There, there are about 8% who declare themselves to be, um, to be undecided at this point. Nevertheless, so um, there's a slight kind of bend to these lines which imply that the race is tightening, in quotes, I guess. Um, it is true that campaigns can matter quite a lot in Mexico. Party identification is pretty strong among those who have it, but according to this estimate, 44% uh, count themselves as independents. And the 30 that count themselves as Morena, that's kind of a light party affiliation because it's a new party. So, you know, you can't really have developed this lifelong sort of attachment where you would define yourself as a morenista, you know, in, 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 a, in a deep sense. I think that that, that could shift. Um, so I don't expect the election to go in favor of Galvez, but I do think that there's room in the legislative portion of the elections to whittle away at Morena's uh, majority. I think that they may achieve a majority, but they won't achieve a supermajority. We can talk about why that matters later on. Uh, a couple of comments about electoral integrity. Um, the elections are overseen by one federal institute. It's autonomous from the federal government, though. Two minutes? Two fingers? I saw four. I saw four. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it organizes elections rather than, say, the county-by-county county organization that we have in the U.S. Um, the, 
There's almost no private money that's permitted in the electoral contest in Mexico. Uh, about 0.3% of all the funds can be raised from party activists. The remaining 99.7% of funding is public and it's doled out according to formula, as is all the mass media time. So the INE, uh, the Federal Elections or National Elections Institute will tell all of the TV channels and the radio stations what ads they have to run when, so that it's all controlled by formula. It's the exact opposite of the Citizens United circumstance in which we find ourselves in the US. Um, there's a free national voter ID card. You have to show the ID card to vote, uh, and it's matched to the voter registration rolls. It carries quite a bit of information. Um, the, uh, the polling places are staffed by poll workers who are selected at random from among registered voters. It's akin to jury duty in the United States. There are ways to get out of it, but, uh, but people do serve. They get some training. They get, some, uh, they get a small stipend. Um, and partisan poll watchers are permitted in the polling stations uh, so they can oversee what, what's going on. Um, Finally, uh, paper ballots are used. Uh, they're marked with sort of a crayon, and then fingers are marked, or thumbs rather, are marked with indelible ink to show that people have voted. Uh, those paper ballots are then <laughs> counted. The partisan poll watchers can, can watch this process. The results are written on a big piece of paper that is posted outside the polling station, and the results are then sent to a district level sort of place where they're computerized and sent off to INE, which will show the results in real time. And I think that's all that I have for now. Uh, right, we can talk about those other things later on. So uh, let me introduce Laura C., who's going to speak about South Africa. Thank you so much, Ken, and thank you so much to the Future Forum for having me. Um, I'm a UT PhD, and when I was a graduate student, I attended many talks in this room, so it's a real thrill for me to be on this side of the podium today. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the elections in South Africa, and something that's gonna make many of us in the room feel very old is the fact that tomorrow, April 26, marks 30 years since this very famous photograph of the country's first democratic elections was taken um, in 1994. South Africa was emerging from the apartheid period, um, and one of the organizations that fought for freedom, the African National Congress, had by that point transformed itself from a liberation movement into a political party. It overwhelmingly won these elections. Nelson Mandela became president. And they have ruled ever since. Um, so South Africa is an interesting and unfortunately increasingly rare example of a country that democratized in the 1990s that has not fallen victim to the challenges of authoritarian backsliding that we're seeing in so many countries around the world, um, especially thinking about post-Cold War transformations on the African continent, Eastern Europe, etc. Next month, on May 29th, South African voters will go to the polls for the country's seventh round of democratic elections. Um, and if the question is, are you better off today than you were 30 years ago? Uh, the answer for virtually everyone in South Africa is yes. The country is freer, it has seen economic recovery, even with challenges over time. Um, there are more opportunities, but there are still massive problems. Um, and one of those problems comes out of the fact that the ANC has ruled for 30 years. Now I wanna be really clear, South Africa's regime is not an authoritarian regime. All of the elections that have happened from 94 to now have been free and fair, um, but one party rule um, is rarely good for democracy. And even when that party is comprised of the heroes of resistance and liberation, uh, temptations quickly fall in. And um, there have been many, many issues over the years, especially uh, with the, the president who preceded this one, a man named Jacob Zuma. Um, so we have had issues of corruption uh, both overt and petty. Um, Jacob Zuma, who served as president until he was removed from office, sent to jail in 2018, uh, 
everything from selling off opportunities to uh, become a minister in exchange for profitable contracting decisions for his, you know, who gets the contract decisions for his cronies, um, to building a personal swimming pool at his own home and charging it to the taxpayers uh, under the guise of it being a fire pool. Um, most fire pools, they're, they're reserves of water used for fighting fires. They don't look like, like the swimming pool in Zuma's backyard. <laughs> um, um, other issues with all the leaders since the beginning of ANC rule, there have been very unfair distributive politics. Um, we now have a broad body of research showing that public goods uh, have been and continue to be delivered first to the constituencies with the highest levels of ANC support. So if your voting ward voted 99.9% .9 for the ANC and the voting ward next door voted 98.7% for the ANC, you got running water first, you got electricity first, you got uh, modern sanitation first, all these kinds of things. Um, this has meant that for a lot of folks in South Africa, there is growing disillusionment with ANC promises and leaders. Um, and this is exacerbated by the fact that although the ANC came to power uh, with a lot of talk about revolution and moving the country into uh, a sort of social justice oriented social welfare state, um, or even into a socialist revolution, some of those guys were old school socialists, um, that inequality has continued um, and uh, continues to worsen. The country is still highly segregated. There are issues over land reform, access to land, particularly for black folks, housing um, and housing quality, the, you know, the ability to live in a decent place. Um, the electrical grid, which is broken in part due to Zuma's corruption and having sold some deals to these men called the Gupta brothers who uh, ruined the system, and crime, which is a major problem, especially in urban areas. Uh, in recent elections, we have seen decreasing turnout. Um, and we now have about a generation and a half of younger people who either were not born in 1994 or were not old enough to remember um, apartheid. And because they did not experience the horrors of apartheid um, and the very violent years in the transition period from 1990 to 1994, they do not have the same loyalty to or the same reverence for the ANC that most of their elders have. Many older South Africans have sort of reflexively voted for the ANC because of their liberationist past. Um, but younger folks don't see that, and they want to know why they can't question what the ANC does. They want to know why they can't question Mandela. Were all his decisions wise? So the election that's coming up in May will be the most contested election in South African history. Um, there are 52 parties contesting um, the national and provincial elections that are happening this year. Um, and of those, there are about six major parties that uh, are likely to garner the most of the vote. Um, in, so, so South Africa has a five-year election cycle. So every five years, provincial and national elections happen at the same time. And then two years later, there are municipal elections. So the last municipal elections were in 2021. And that was the first election ever where the ANC polled under 50% nationally. That is, they won fewer than 50% of uh, seats in municipal offices, city hall, that kind of thing um, at the national level. Um, the polling that we're getting right now is pretty good quality, and it is showing that the ANC is going to likely get below, well below 50%, uh, which is necessary to form a government in the country's parliamentary uh, proportional representation system. Um, the latest polls show the ANC getting between 37 and 41% of the vote, so that will still be enough to be the dominant party, but they will not have enough to form a government on their own, which means they are going to have to enter a coalition. Uh, the most likely coalition party is the Democratic Democratic Alliance, the DA, which is coming in second with about 20 to 27 percent of the vote at the moment. Um, and South Africa has never had a coalition government before. The ANC has never had to share power. So it's a very open question as to what's going to happen. Presumably, the current president, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, will be re-elected president. He'll, you know, his party is going to win, so they will uh, ensure his election in the deal. Um, 
but we are in a, a really interesting time in South African politics and a really interesting time in South African history. And it is chaotic. It is, there's a lot of uncertainty. But I also want to argue that this is, this is a positive for democratic consolidation. Um, as I said, it is rarely good for democracy for one party to rule. It is good for there to be contestation. It is good for a robust opposition to question what the ruling party is doing. It is good for party to change hand, for power to change hands back and forth between parties. And you know, the old, what we call the two turnover rule uh, that we would teach in introductory comparative politics, when you've gone back and forth two times, you can say you're, you're a consolidated democracy. So I think that, you know, that, that South Africa is slowly and steadily moving toward a more democratic future. Um, and this doesn't undermine the ANC's accomplishments at all, but it hopefully is going to spur them to do better and spur the leaders of the party to crack down on corruption um, at every level. So I look forward to talking about this, and I believe now we're going to move to the, to the Q&A time. Thanks. Questions? Can I um, ask for a couple words um, on? Uh, oh, we'll take questions. But uh, I know that you also had uh, s uh, some thoughts on uh, South Korea and on uh, South Sudan. Yeah. I don't know, Ken. If you and you have a country B. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll keep my remarks on South Korea brief. I think again that you know the main implication of the the legislative elections, which just concluded, um, will be to keep the president constrained as he has been in the the first two years of his five year term. Um, so uh, he has some challenges in terms of domestic approval. Um, and has spent a lot of energy during the period um, where that he's been constrained domestically, um, concentrating on strengthening relations with the United States as well as with Japan. Um, if you remember the Camp David summit with, between the, the President Biden and the, the presidents of um, South Korea and Japan. So I think the, the likely effect of the, the elections in terms of the, the region-wide and global dynamics will be a continued focus on foreign policy as the, the cornerstone of his legacy given the challenges of trying to accomplish his main priorities on the domestic front. South Sudan. Uh, so a, qu a quick background. South Sudan became an independent country in 2009. Um, has never had an election. Um, the leaders of the country came out of a peace agreement that was signed to end the country's civil war with Sudan that it was then part of um, in 2005. And um, there were supposed to be elections in 2015, but in 2013, a civil war started between groups uh, led slash backed slash lots of under the table kinds of things by the president and one of the vice presidents. Um, and that war lasted until 2018. And so hypothetically, we are going to see elections in South Sudan in uh, December. Um, every observer of this situation uh, thinks that if these elections happen at all, which is still very much an open question, there has not been the level of preparation uh, that we would need to see to have a successful election, things like voter registration, um, logistical challenges, you know, just literally getting ballot boxes to some places in South Sudan is an extraordinarily difficult challenge. Um, and I, I am pretty skeptical that they're going to happen at all. Um, but if they do, I don't think anyone believes that they will be free and fair. Um, and I think that will be by design um, on the part of, of the presidency and other leaders. Um, I, I, you know, it's people certainly have the right to choose their leaders, but it has to be done well. And typically in a country that's emerging from conflict, a new country, a very fragile country like South Sudan, you would need a tremendous level of support for the international community. Uh, so I was living in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo right before that country had uh, its first elections in 2006. And the United Nations, other agencies were involved in every aspect, the United States government and the European governments financed all kinds of activities, voter education, mobilizing civil society groups, 
um, we're really not seeing that level of attention in South Sudan that would be necessary for, for a successful election. So I'm pretty skeptical, unfortunately. Good. I take questions. I'm just curious, is there foreign interference by, let's say, Russia or China in any of these elections? I was just curious. I'll take that question with respect to Taiwan. Um, yeah, there's, there are active efforts at election interference of various types. There's uh, a lot of, of cybersecurity issues in, in Taiwan. There are also issues with disinformation and misinformation, as well as um, you know, political moves that are sometimes interpreted and framed in Taiwan domestic politics as efforts to influence electoral outcomes. So for example, um, Beijing made several statements about uh, voters choosing a more conflictual path. I can't remember the exact wording, and I'd, I'd have to look it up. It sort of indicated that that um, that there, they had a preference and that a more sort of peaceful, less contentious relationship with Beijing hinged on um, preference for the, the KMT candidates. Again, I'd have to look at the exact wording, but there are political statements that also seem designed to shape voters' perceptions of what's at stake in the election. Um, coming from mainland China, that's the overt side, and then there's this other set of, of um, efforts that are, are harder to de detect and pick up on, um, where I think we probably have some information about what's happening, but, but not complete information. But, but as to the question of is it there, yes. I think the answer for Mexico is probably yes, but I don't have any concrete proof. There, um, in every election cycle, uh, there are rumors about uh, attempted influence, for, uh, for instance, um, following the uh, 2016 elections in the U.S. with Oxford Analytic, uh, Analytica, mm -hmm. Analytica uh, and the targeted Facebook uh, advertisements, uh, there were rumors that similar things had occurred in Mexico. Social media is not at all regulated by the National Electoral Institute, uh, so it's quite likely that there are attempts to, to sway people. In this particular election at the presidential level, um, there isn't a need to sway people in favor of Morena if that's the, the foreign country's interest, and there really isn't a chance of, of uh, I think, getting Galvez over the finish line ahead of Sheinbaum. Um, so any influence would probably be associated with either gubernatorial elections or, uh, or Congress, and I don't have any concrete information about it, but I, I would, I'd be surprised if there weren't attempts, I guess. So South Africa, there's certainly plenty of social media disinformation and misinformation campaigns, just like there are everywhere in the world right now. Um, one of the other challenges is that about a year ago, actually, um, the president of South Africa or someone high up in the South African government uh, was challenged by the United States ambassador that the country was collaborating with and supplying weapons to um, Russia for its fight against Ukraine. And there was a ship in a place near Cape Town called Simons Bay uh, that was being loaded. And, um, you know, they had pictures of it. They had, had evidence. Um, and this caused a massive diplomatic row. Um, you know, the ambassador was called in. It was, it was a whole thing. Um, that seems to have died down. Um, I haven't heard a lot about that lately. Um, but certainly there is concern. I think that, um, you know, South Africa is not... Um, an unflinching ally of the West, maybe is the best way to put it. The, the history there, the Cold War, you know, the United States was on the wrong side um, of history in, in apartheid South Africa. We sided with the apartheid regime um, because they claimed to be anti-communist. Um, the South Africans also had, the, the apartheid regime also had a very close relationship with Israel. Um, that's part of the story of how both countries uh, came to acquire nuclear weapons, um, although South Africa no longer has them. It's the only country ever to denuclearize. Um, and so the South African government has been extremely critical of the situation in Gaza. Um, as you may know, they uh, took, took uh, Israel to the International uh, Court of Justice a few months ago, and we're still waiting on a final ruling uh, from The Hague on that. Um, but all of that has kind of led to an environment where there is a mistrust of the West and a feeling that the Soviet Union was on our side back in the day because the Soviet Union did a lot to support the liberation movement training cadres, supplying weapons, those sorts of things. Um, and President Ramaphosa is very much a product of that era. He came out of the country's trade union movement, uh, rose up through the ranks of the ANC. Um, and so I think he's someone who might be a little bit more inclined to trust Moscow. Um, now, does that mean that Moscow will come to his aid to help him win an election that he's already predicted to win? 
that to me is an open question. And it seems to me that the Russians, uh, their interest in Africa is more in the Sahel, where they are taking over a lot of the security functions that were previously undertaken by the French and by the United Nations. Um, but, you know, I, there's nothing I wouldn't believe could happen um, in that situation at the moment. Hey, good morning. Afternoon, I suppose. Uh, my name is Skip Davis. Uh, I've been a Future Forum member for quite a while. We love uh, the programs, Ms. McC Ms. McCracken, and the library put together. And I'm happy to hear you talking about these vital um, self-determination issues in what I consider to be the three most uh, um, conflicted areas of the, of the earth today. My question is, uh, what is it do you think that each of your nations expect in terms of assistance or guidance from the United States in moving themselves to uh, a more free uh, democratic uh, form of leadership? Yes, please. Okay. Well, um, as mentioned earlier, Taiwan's elections are widely regarded as some of the most free and fair in their administration um, in the world today. Um, they outscore and us. So <laughs> the lessons have to go the other direction. <laughs> and so I guess I would answer that question sort of t two ways. So the direct answer to your question about, about uh, enhancing democracy in Taiwan is that was a struggle that was won by the people of Taiwan um, and that they've continued to push forward on their own terms. And it's really something that needs to be debated and decided by them. And they, they seem, judging from the results, perfectly capable of doing so. Um, it is very clear that Taiwan wants support from the United States and from the broader international community, particularly communities of democ of demo community of democracies worldwide, in ensuring that its relations with the mainland can be determined peacefully and not by coercion. And so that's where assistance from the United States, but also from a, a, gr a number of countries around the world comes in. And, and Taiwan is very actively sought, and I would say with some, some real diplomatic nuance and, and skill, um, to position itself as a beacon of democracy, as a country that is economically, culturally um, uh, an appealing partner for a, a lot of countries around the world. And that's designed to show that Taiwan has a lot to offer um, as a partner, as an example, as a participant in the, the global community, because it recognizes that just if you look at the math, an island of 20 to 25 million people, um, compared to a nation of 1.3 billion with one of the world's most powerful militaries and very high levels of military spending. Um, those, just numerically, those are tough odds. And so that international support becomes um, important in creating an international environment where Taiwan's democracy can continue to be determined and shaped by the people of Taiwan. So I'm, I'm not sure that the people of South Africa want anything from the United States uh, at this point, the leadership. As I mentioned, there is this very problematic history um, of the U.S. being on the wrong side. It took until 1985 uh, for the United States Congress to pass a major piece of legislation condemning the apartheid regime. Um, and those of you who are around at the time or have studied it may remember that Reagan vetoed that law. Um, there was enough support in Congress to override the veto. Um, but there is still a lot of bitterness, a lot of, of feeling of mistrust. Um, so I'm part of something called the African Center for the Study of the United States. Um, and I think that our name kind of gives away the game there, that we are interested in a decolonial de project. We are interested in um, flipping narratives. So many US universities have a center for African studies. Why should African universities not have centers for studies of the United States? Um, and one of the things we're really interested in is what lessons can South Africa teach to the world? Um, so I don't, I don't want to be indelicate, but yesterday on this campus, um, there was a very relevant uh, happening, so, which South Africa has a lot of experience with. What happens when peaceful protesters are met with overwhelming and disproportionate force? Um, does that kill dissent? Does that solve the conflict that, that one is trying to solve? And, and the answer from South African history is a resounding no, right? That actually what that will do, if you think about something like the Sharpeville protests, uh, which we know is the Sharpeville Massacre, when people went to protest at a local police station and the police responded by, by firing on the crowd, including many children, um, it tends to bring more attention to the cause. It tends to bring more interest. Um, it tends to bring more people into the cause. And that's the kind of work that I think most South Africans are more interested in now than what can the U.S. do for us. 
Ken, can you wrap it up for us? I'll try to do so quickly. I know it's uh, 1 p.m. at this point. Um, Mexico is, of course, incredibly reliant on the U.S. and on Texas in particular for, for all kinds of things. Um, of course, trade is fundamentally important. Um, when it comes to elections uh, and party politics, I think what Mexico would prefer is non-interference. Uh, there was a very telling and worrying, worrying episode that probably escaped attention uh, in the U.S. media uh, about um, two years ago. Uh, the sitting president, Lopez Obrador, thinks he lost the 2006 elections due to fraud. The margin was half a percentage point, and it stuck with him. He just can't let it go. He somehow convinced uh, the current U.S. ambassador to make a public statement uh, that he has questions regarding the, um, the 2006 elections. Uh, I don't know why it was important for, for AMLO, the sitting president, to make that happen, and I have no idea why the U.S. ambassador went out of his way to make a statement like that in public. It caused such a scandal that the Biden administration had to quickly backpedal, try to take it all back. Um, I'm a little surprised that the ambassador kept his job after that, frankly, but, uh, but the point is that um, I think non-interference when it comes to questions of elections. So that's it. Well, thank you, everyone. Just to wrap up. Thank you all. Thank you all, and I want to say a quick word of thanks, especially to Larry, Sheena, Laura, and Ken for the informative discussion. Um, and thank you all for being here. We'd love to tell you more about Future Forum and what we have in store. Natalia uh, Morgan, our donor and member ma membership manager, is going to be over here at the table if you have any questions. But thank you, and have a good afternoon.